Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, the webinar this evening. Thank you for joining our JC webinar series. My name is Tara Evans, and I'm the team leader for communications and engagement at the College of Medicine and Dentistry. I'm a proud JCU alumni, and I'm also the moderator for tonight's webinar. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this country and pay my respects to their uh, elders past and present. In the spirit of reconciliation, I also would like to acknowledge the valuable contribution that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to make to both James Cook University and the broader community. Now this webinar is the latest in a series where we invite some of our very best researchers and academics to share their expertise with the local community outside the lecture theatre. In tonight's webinar, you're going to hear how Dr. Letson overcame the many obstacles she'd faced on her Plan B career journey, and how she's inspiring, inspiring the next generation of health professionals to engage with and contribute to medical research to ensure treatments and drug therapies continue to progress into the future. Before I, I introduce our speaker, just some housekeeping for everybody. If you do happen to have any questions at all during the presentation, if I could just get you to please type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel. I'll be monitoring this function throughout the presentation and um, I'll be very happy to raise your questions with Hayley whenever appropriate. Now to introduce our speaker for tonight. So Dr. Hayley Letson is a Senior Research Fellow in the Heart Trauma and Sepsis Research Laboratory in the College of Medicine and Dentistry here at James Cook University. After graduating with a university medal um, from a Bachelor of Science with a double, double major in physiology and pharmacology, as well as biochemistry and molecular biology, Haley also completed a PhD developing here with James Cook University, developing a novel small volume fluid therapy for resuscitation of traumatic hemorrhagic shock. For the past 12 years, Haley has actually been developing this drug therapy with her supervisor, Professor Jeffrey Dobson, for use on the battlefield with support of funding from the US military. Dr. Letson's work in the field of trauma resuscitation science has been internationally recognized with three consecutive Young Investigator Awards from the American Heart Association. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Haley. Thank you so much, Tara, uh, and thank you everyone um, for taking time out of your Thursday night to join us for this webinar tonight. This um, presentation is very different to what I'm used to because I've been asked to talk about myself um, and anyone who knows me knows that's not something that I'm particularly comfortable with. Um, I have, however, been set a specific task and that task is to essentially be a real life example of this meme. A, here's one we prepared earlier, if you like. Now, I understand that many of you attending the webinar tonight may be year 12 students or parents of students, and you're at that nerve wracking time where you're waiting on your final scores and university offers. Some of you may have applied for our medicine course here at JCU and may or may not have been granted an interview. I'm here to assure you if plan A didn't work, don't despair um, because the alphabet does have 25 more letters. I'm going to start tonight um, by telling you about my original plan A and how that panned out. And um, then I'm going to talk about um, the work that I currently do as a medical research scientist, uh, developing a new drug therapy for traumatic injury and bleeding. And I'll finish with some hopefully useful advice um, and share some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. So my plan A uh, from the age of five was to become a doctor. I don't know where it came from because no one in my family worked in the medical field and I didn't have any early exposure to doctors or hospitals. I did, however, have a fascination with the human body and a love of science, which grew throughout my school years. Plan A never changed. Um, it was finish school, study medicine and have a career as a doctor. I successfully navigated the finishing school bit um, and commenced my undergraduate science studies. So this was back when medicine was only offered as a postgraduate four year course in Queensland. And then one otherwise innocuous Wednesday, 10 days before Christmas, um, while I was home on university holidays, life threw me a curveball. 
uh, a curveball in the form of a large four-wheel drive with an illegal oversized bull bar, which crashed directly into me when I was sitting in the back seat of our stationary family car. Um, it was a moment and just a tiny moment in my life, but it would change things forever, um, even if I wasn't completely aware of that fact at the time. I don't actually recall much. Um, I know it was hot because it was a December in Cairns. Um, I know another two cars had a crash because the drivers were too busy having a sticky beak at me. Um, I know I couldn't get out because um, the car had literally crumpled around me. And I distinctly remember the exact moment um, when I realized I couldn't move my neck. And I said to my brother who was outside the car trying to keep me company, I think I'm in trouble. In my naivety, I still couldn't possibly have imagined that I would still be feeling the effects of that accident every day, uh, almost or over 20 years later now. I had um, spinal injuries, which affected my mobility and caused chronic daily pain. And as is commonly the case with the spine, which is essentially our body's anchor, um, the surgeries and treatments to repair those injuries and enable me to walk again unaided led to nerve damage and other health issues. So all of a sudden, uh, my plan A was the last thing on my mind. Recovery was long and difficult. I am going to admit that I was a really terrible patient. Um, I was just so impatient. I was always trying to push my body further than I should and being frustrated by my progress. I had to accept that I was dealing with a new level of ability and that my planned career timeline I'd had since the age of five required adjustment. So the path from photo one to photo two in this slide um, ended up being so much slower and tougher than I ever could have imagined. I started slow. Um, I was able to complete one university subject and then build from there. And as part of one of my subjects, um, I did a small research project in a molecular biology lab and I, I really loved it. Having um, spent much more time than I would have cared for in a hospital, I also was starting to see the limitations of a clinical career. Only being able to help the patients that you have direct contact with um, and being limited to the treatments currently available. I wanted to improve outcomes and help patients all over the world. So I found myself at this crossroads where um, the path forward was continuing on with plan A and becoming a clinician. Although um, I had a deep interest in the field of stem cell research, um, plan B to pursue a career as a molecular biologist wasn't quite right. I am a very visual person and working with DNA samples that I couldn't see with the naked eye left me wanting. My personal experience with my accident and my surgeries also taught me that nothing in the body happens or operates independently. So everything is interconnected and you can't treat one organ or area without having an impact on others. To me, it seemed obvious that medicine needed a whole body systems approach, especially when it came to traumatic injury. So when we suffer a major injury, there's an effect not just locally where the injury occurs, but also systemically. So mediators are released into the bloodstream and they're carried right throughout the body. Unbeknownst to me at the time, there was a professor of physiology in the building next door that shared my philosophy. Meeting this professor, Jeffrey Dobson, would convince me to throw away plan A and plan B and pursue a medical research career instead. That was 2007 um, and Jeff remains my boss, mentor and colleague to this day. And Hayley, can I just jump in there and ask, sure. I guess, with your, um, uh, I guess, meeting of, of Jeff and, and things like that, was that something that you had sort of gone out of your way to actually pursue sort of taking on extra things while you were at university? Or was it just one of those kind of freak kind of chance um, meetings with someone that, you know, you think almost must have been fate? So I, I, I had heard about Jeff from um, one of the professors, Jim Bunnell, in biochemistry. Um, I, I knew that they were friends. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, so it just so happened that, you know, I was trying to work out what to do and, and decided to go and have a chat with him. And so, and that's, that chat basically changed the direction of my whole life and my career. So, um, yeah, a bit of a fortuitous just 
happening. And I said, I hadn't been taught by Jeff, um, which was unusual. Um, a lot of people have been taught by Jeff um, in medicine and biomed at this uni. And um, so that was my first encounter with him. Um, and yeah, he kind of blew me away. And straight away, I just knew that I wanted to work with him. And the rest is history, I guess. Is they the say. rest is history. Yeah. So, because at Thanks, the time, baby. that's okay. At the time, um, he'd been working in heart research and he was looking to branch out to the whole body. So I think he was maybe also looking for a student at that time that could kind of take on this project. And so um, if you know Jeff, he, he has an office full of paper. And when we met, um, he handed me a pile of papers to read, um, which I dutifully did. And um, amongst that pile happened to be this quote. So whilst the widespread training of medics in tactical combat casualty care has clearly saved lives, the use of saline and colloid starch by medics on the battlefield does not represent a single technological advance in ability since saline was first used for resuscitation in 1831. God. 1831, I, I was stunned and honestly initially thought it was a typo. Um, I couldn't believe that we'd gone 175 years, almost two centuries with no medical advancement and no medical breakthroughs. So that was the quote, as well as meeting Jeff, that set me on the path to try and change this situation. This was my plan C, I guess. And it was a plan I never could have foreshadowed while at school and even in my initial university years. And I'm happy to say Plan C has worked really nicely for me. So Jeff and I have um, developed a, a new advance in the field of battlefield medicine that's ready for human trial. And so what I'm going to do now in this next part of the webinar is give you a brief overview of that story and also talk about some of the processes that we go through in developing new medical therapies, which is essentially my day job. So... As a scientist uh, trying to develop new medical therapies and treatments, it's important to understand the problem at a really fundamental level. So this slide shows military death statistics from a review of US combat deaths over 10 years of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. So you can see there 26% of the deaths were classified as being potentially survivable. So if you add that up, that equates to more than a thousand soldiers making it home safely to their families and friends. And importantly, the other thing out of this review was we found that more than almost 90% of all deaths occurred within the first 30 minutes on the battlefield after injury from bleeding. So from that, we know that a potential treatment needs to be able to be administered quickly and have immediate effect. So if we can develop a treatment to stop bleeding, it may help prevent all those unnecessary deaths. First responders and clinicians on the ground, so whether that be medics on the battlefield or doctors in hospitals or other health centres, um, are our best source of information when it comes to trying to understand the problem. So as much as possible, we go direct to the source because they have really unique insights. And there was one particular discussion that Jeff had with a US military trauma surgeon, which really influenced our approach to the problem of saving lives on the battlefield. This surgeon happened to be one of the first responders when three young, brave Aussie soldiers were tragically gunned down and lost their lives in a green on blue attack by a man in an Afghan army uniform on base in Aruzgan province. Jeff, being the good scientist he is, um, asked the surgeon what he needed to save those lives. The surgeon's response was very simple. I just needed 10 minutes, he said. So to save lives, we needed to stop bleeding and find a way to buy time. It's a slippery slope uh, following major injury and, and bleeding. So we get these effects throughout the whole body. Blood loss uh, reduces oxygen delivery to the tissues and we get this mutually perpetuating combination of hypothermia where the body temperature drops as shock sets in, um, acidosis which causes tissue damage and multiple organ failure and coagulopathy. Coagulopathy is a word you'll hear me say a lot. This is a dysfunction of the blood clotting system whereby the blood becomes increasingly thin so it's unable to form blood clots so we can't stop bleeding. And one of the problems with uh, traditional treatments where bleeding patients are given large volumes of fluids like saline is that this can actually worsen the coagulopathy. 
And we now know that the presence of this coagulopathy on admission to a field hospital, um, an emergency department or a trauma centre is associated with significantly worse fourfold increase in mortality, multi-organ failure, increased blood transfusion requirements and also longer hospital stays. So coagulopathy is incredibly dangerous. And this graphic really highlights the complexity of the problem that we're trying to address. And it does go some way to explain why there has been no medical advancement in this area since 1831, and why currently there is no effective um, fluid therapy for resuscitation and stabilization of injured and bleeding patients. So that's our problem. And, and our task as scientists is to design the ideal resuscitation fluid to fulfill that unmet need. So first and foremost, uh, any therapy needs to be safe, effective, and also cost effective. It must also be easy to administer, especially on the battlefield when medics are offering, often delivering um, care under fire. So um, if an IV can't be used, I mean, in other words, if a line or a cannula can't be inserted into a blood vessel um, to inject drugs, medicines and fluids, there is another option um, which is available, which is intraosseous injection, and that goes directly into the bone. And this can be achieved with a blue device like the one shown here. Basically, this can deliver drug therapy uh, directly into the sternum in the chest or like the long bone, the femur um, in the leg, for example. Now, it's no use in developing a really effective therapy if it's not suitable for the environment, the conditions in which it's going to be used. Low cube weight simply refers to minimising the weight as much as possible. Combat medics, especially those um, as part of the Special Operations Forces, operate in far forward environments. They've got very limited carrying capacity. So I've got circled in red here. So this is a standard combat medic kit that needs to service multiple casualties. So it goes without saying that any fluid therapy for the battlefield needs to be small volume. And it also can't require any refrigeration or special handling. I'll skip over the permissive hypertension because I'm going to describe that with a picture or a graphic on the next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, coagulopathy is incredibly dangerous and um, it's really important that, that this is reversed early to reduce mortality and improve patient outcomes. Now, Hayley, I'm just going to jump in quickly. We've had a question come in from sure. the audience. Yep. Just wondering sort of, I guess, how heavy roughly are the kits that actually army medics carry, if you know? Yeah, so um, they can carry on top of the... Um, like the normal gear they carry so the especially for far forward when they're going they're going into really remote areas so each of those combat medics can be carrying in addition to their their gear that they need weapons ammunition they can also be carrying up to 20 kilos of medical equipment and supplies um but wow. the, there's a really um there was a story that um a paper that I once read, a trauma surgeon um, who was uh, operating as a combat medic and he found himself um, basically having to make this incredibly difficult choice. He only had enough fluids to save one, um, one soldier and he had two in front of him. Um, so that's a situation that we don't want to happen. Um, and that, um, unfortunately, um, it's, it's a logistical thing that, that they can only carry so much because they also still need to be agile and, and mobile course what a terrible situation to have to find yourself in mm -hmm. yes um so you say the correction of coagulopathy that reduces mortality that improves patient outcomes the therapy um, should also ideally reduce inflammation um, and and pain if possible correct acidosis, um, reduce stress, and also reduce or prevent secondary injury. So while it's often possible to use large volumes of fluids like saline to save a bleeding patient, those patients can be vulnerable to late mortality in the days after the original injury um, because of secondary injury, um, such as fluid buildup in the lungs or organ failure. So just a quick word on this concept of permissive hypotension. So most people are familiar with the term hypertension where you've got high blood pressure. Hypotension is the opposite and simply means low blood pressure. And when we say normotension, that means blood pressure within the normal range. 
So the dial here represents your mean arterial blood pressure, um, which or MAP, and, and this is calculated from the two numbers you get when you get your blood pressure taken. So the high value, which represents the systolic pressure and the low value, which represents the diastolic pressure. Bleeding causes our blood pressure to drop. And when it reaches about 40 millimeters of mercury, we consider this a shock state and that requires resuscitation. But what years of research have shown us is that if you increase the blood pressure too high, so if you go um, actually to normal above 80 millimetres of mercury, the outcome's actually worse. And this is because if the blood pressure is too high, it will pop any blood clots that have formed and that will then lead to more bleeding. So the target is this green area in the middle, permissive hypotension, where the pressure is just high enough so that there's sufficient blood circulating to the tissues, but not so high that the blood clots will be dislodged. So now that I've described the target, here's the solution that Jeff and I have developed. It's called ALM and it's a combination of three drugs, adenosine, lidocaine and magnesium. Some of you may have already heard of these drugs before. So adenosine is a naturally occurring compound which forms from the breakdown of ATP, which is the primary energy source of all of our body cells. Lidocaine or lignocaine, depending on the country you're in, um, is an anesthetic, which is often applied topically for its numbing effect. And magnesium is a nutrient that's vital for many processes in the body, including nerve and muscle function. The treatment is designed as a two-step therapy. So first of all is a small bolus of about 80 mils of fluid, which can be administered at the point of injury. So this is sufficient to resuscitate and stabilize the patient for 60 minutes while they're moved to a place of safety. The second part is a low volume drip of about 40 mils of fluid per hour for an 80 kilogram soldier. So this can be administered during evacuation to definitive care to protect the organs from secondary injury. For an 80 kilo adult, what we're looking at is about 240 mils or a cup of fluid um, over a five hour period. Now, if we compare this to traditional fluid resuscitation, um, this can in some cases require up to eight litres of fluid because it moves out of the circulation very quickly. And when that happens, the blood pressure drops again and more fluid is required. Not only will eight litres of fluid um, increase the chances of popping those blood clots, it's also likely to accumulate in the lungs. And one of the major problems um, found after the Vietnam War was that although they could save wounded soldiers from shock early with fluids, um, many ended up dying from what at the time they called Da Nang Lung or wet lung. This was an acute res respiratory distress syndrome due to fluid buildup in the lungs. Notwithstanding that, um, from a purely logistics perspective and that we were just talking about before, weight is a really important consideration in battlefield medicine. So intravenous fluids are actually one of the heaviest components that combat medics carry. Um, we know that soldiers carry maybe 30 to 40 kilos of gear, so that's their normal helmet, ammunition, weapons. But yeah, as I said before, combat medics can have to carry an excess of 20 kilos of medical supplies on top of that. So if you do the calculations um, for the same weight of fluids to, to treat one soldier with traditional fluid resuscitation, we could treat 26 soldiers um, with ALM. It's incredible. And that's one of the main targets for in terms of battlefield is small volume. Everything has to be small volume. So the balance is getting um, an effect with a small volume that you don't have to keep, uh, keep adding fluid which is, is one of the great things that ALM does. So it sounds, Hayley, if you don't mind if I interrupt again. Sure. You know, it, it, this sounds like really exciting research. And, um, you know, we have had another question from the audience, uh, sort mm -hmm. of curious as to why um, we're only working with the US military at this point in time. Mm, so, um, it, yeah, unfortunately, we have tried um, um, over many years Um to have the Australian military involved and the US has also tried to sort of bring that in. Um, we, we, were, we did have an announcement today um, as part of the election coverage um, 
that hopefully we were we will get some funding um, that that means that we can have some work here and that will benefit um, the Australian Defence Force as well. Um, but it comes down to funding, and so um, we've we've only been able to attract funds from, from the US. So we've been lucky that we've had that support. Um, that, that doesn't mean to say that Australians won't have, Australian soldiers won't get benefit from it um, as part of the Five Eyes um, and, and NATO arrangements. But um, at the moment, the US military have been the ones that have, uh, have coughed up the money for me to do all this work. Thanks, Hayley. No worries. So all of that work um, that I've been doing um, over the past 12 years, we've really been developing and fine tuning this ALM therapy um, in multiple small and large animal um, preclinical models of trauma and hemorrhage. And so what we've shown repeatedly is that the ALM rescues and stabilizes the heart. Um, it protects the organs, including the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the liver and lungs. Um, it also reduces inflammation and acidosis. So that was part of that lethal triad that I presented earlier. And importantly, it reverses coagulopathy within five minutes and that really reduces the bleeding. So um, you may recall that earlier I was talking about how dangerous coagulopathy is. It really increases the risk of death and it worsens patient outcomes. So the ALM, corrects the coagulopathy and stops bleeding. It does this um, almost by acting like a pharmacological tourniquet. Now, I think most people will be familiar with traditional physical tourniquets um, that work by stopping the blood below where the tourniquet is tied. These are only useful um, if the source of the bleeding is an injury to the extremities, so the arms or the legs. But if the bleeding's internal, um, such as in our abdomen or chest, we can't tie a tourniquet or, or apply pressure to stop that type of bleeding. And of the 4,200 bleeding deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan, 86% or about 3,600 were due to non-compressible hemorrhage. So they couldn't be helped with a traditional tourniquet. ALM um, through its action is like having an imaginary tourniquet inside the body in those areas that we can't reach. After major traumatic liver injury, what we've shown is that ALM reduces internal bleeding um, by 60%. And so we've got a visual representation here um, in the middle showing um, blood clotting with ALM treatment and without ALM treatment. So this is taken from um, a very expensive, uh, fancy piece of medical um, technology called a Rotem. But what we can do is put a blood sample in and we get this real time picture of the blood clotting. Um, we can also measure how fast the blood clots, how strong the clot is, and also whether it falls apart. So without ALM, um, the blood can't clot. So you get this flat green line. But what you can see with ALM, we get this um, nice, strong, healthy, stable blood clot forming within minutes. And there's also no sign of the clot breaking down an hour later. So the other thing, so coagulopathy is one thing that's, that's obviously really key in saving lives. But the other thing um, that I talked about early was buying time as a strategy to save those lives early after traumatic injury and bleeding. And so for this, we borrow from the tricks of natural hibernators. We can't um, stop physical time. So the time the clock ticks around, um, if I could do that, I'd do that because it, I'd be a gazillionaire. But um, <laughs> we can try to slow biological time. This biological time is dynamic and it differs depending on the metabolic rate. So this is the rate at which our body uses energy to maintain life. Buying biological time um, by lowering the metabolic rate and therefore the energy demands of a bleeding patient without damaging the vital organs, so the heart and the brain, is a key life-saving opportunity in the first few minutes after catastrophic injury. We all know that um, blood's essential to survival because it transports the oxygen that we require to sustain life. But following major blood loss, our body's supply of oxygen is markedly reduced. What ALM does is similar to a hibernating animal. It reduces the whole body metabolism and in doing so, it reduces the demand for oxygen. So that preserves the vital supplies. So if we reduce the oxygen demand when the supply is low, then it corrects the imbalance. Simultaneously, the ALM will redirect the blood flow and improve oxygen delivery to the vital organs of the body, so the brain and the heart. 
Um, what we've shown today is that ALM increases survival to three days after a major um, non-compressible hemorrhage, and that's without any other treatment. So this would be a real game changer, obviously, for combat medics, especially those trying to save lives in hostile environments when evacuation is not always possible or it can be delayed. So this plan C of mine um, really did take off when the US military, so um, it was firstly the Navy and then Special Operations Command, they came on board to support the research we were doing with ALM. So this support from them enabled us to confirm the efficacy of the small volume ALM therapy for hemorrhagic shock. And we also know now, which is important that ALM stable for 180 80 days at a range of temperatures from 4 to 45 degrees. And that was part of those ideal fluid resuscitation criteria that I presented earlier. But um, one of the lessons that I learned in the switch from the plan A to the plan B to plan C uh, was to always um, keep yourself open to new possibilities and be adaptable. So an increasing problem um, being faced by the US military at the time we were developing the ALM was a new insidious injury, a traumatic brain injury, which led to an expansion of my plan C um, to tackle that issue as well. The incidence of um, traumatic brain injury is especially high in the military population. Um, so the change in weaponry and the widespread use of IEDs, so those improvised explosive devices, led to traumatic brain injury being recognised as the signature injury um, of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. And the current estimates are that about 20% um, of all returned servicemen and women will have um, experienced at least one traumatic brain injury. Um, now, I just want to point out that um, mild traumatic brain injury is a bit of a misnomer. So traumatic brain injuries or TBIs are classified um, as mild, moderate or severe. And that's primarily based on a number of clinical signs, um, including the period of unconsciousness after the injury. A mild TBI can have devastating lifelong effects. And sadly, we're seeing the consequences of um, TBI and return servicemen and women who are experiencing PTSD, uh, cognitive deficits and early onset dementia. And psychiatric comorbidities um, such as chronic depression, um, anxiety and post-traumatic stress are very prevalent in military personnel with combat related traumatic brain injury. Um, often combatants um, suffer polytrauma, so multiple injuries at the same time. Um, one of the most common uh, combinations is um, hemorrhage or bleeding, so from maybe from a penetrating wound with a traumatic brain injury, so um, a head wound or a concussion. Now, this combination, which is very common, um, especially in, in the most recent conflicts, um, is that is uniquely challenging because often what's good for the body is bad for the brain and vice versa. So um, as I talked about earlier, so for bleeding patients, we aim for permissive hypotension. So we don't want the blood pressure too high that it's gonna pop those blood clots and cause more bleeding. However, the recommendation for brain injury is to actually increase the blood pressure to ensure there's sufficient blood flow to the brain to prevent cell death. But what we showed before was that um, ALM increased blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain after hemorrhagic shock. So ALM then became quite a promising candidate to test for the early treatment of traumatic brain injury. What we wanted to show was that the ALM could protect the brain at those lower blood pressures. So the treatment would be suitable for both hemorrhagic shock and traumatic brain injury alone, but also its lethal combination. So that's what we did next. Um, so in a, a model of traumatic, moderate traumatic brain injury, ALM therapy increased survival and importantly, it increased brain blood flow threefold. So by reducing the body's demand for oxygen, um, the ALM was able to increase the blood flow to the, blood flow to the brain um, and that prevents what we call secondary injury. So following um, any traumatic brain injury, there's always an initial reduction in blood flow to the brain and that causes um, hypoxia, which is low oxygen. By increasing brain blood flow, ALM therapy is preventing brain cell death and also protecting the brain from secondary injury. The ALM um, therapy also significantly decreased the levels of various brain injury markers in both the brain tissue um, and in the bloodstream. 
So when we damage our brains, the protective blood-brain barrier, which would usually prevent foreign particles um, and large molecules from um, traveling from the brain to the bloodstream and vice versa, is breached. And our neurons or brain cells release these damage markers. So what we showed was that for the same injury force to the brain, when ALM was administered soon after the traumatic brain injury, the extent of the brain damage was actually reduced. ALM also prevented um, secondary injury by reducing inflammation. The um, inflammatory response associated with traumatic brain injury contributes to brain swelling and we get elevated intracranial pressure. So our skull is fixed in its size and shape. Um, so there's not a lot of room for the brain to swell um, or increase in size. What we also get is these hematomas, which are pools of blood, um, and these can contribute to um, inflammation and damage as well. So not only did the ALM um, attenuate or block the production of these pro-inflammatory markers, which cause damage and inflammation, we also found that they increased the expression of anti-inflammatory markers, and these are involved with healing after damage. So they may actually improve recovery. And so Hayley, what's the window of time there, I guess, that you're having to administer the, administer the drug in um, to have these sorts of positive effects? Yeah, so I mean, we, we mainly base um, our window for point of injury care, we mainly base our window on a 15 minute um, period, um, which is just based on the guidelines for um, for a combat medic being available. Um, but there's certainly, so I mean, there's a lot of talk about um, a golden hour in trauma and hemorrhage, but for us, the, the sooner the better. So we're, we, you know, possibly going out to half an hour, but in terms of um, any sort of treatment like this, the earlier is the better. Um, and so as soon as possible, that's why we want to get just the first part of the treatment in to start the process. Um, yeah, and then go from there. So say at the moment, we, we have a target of 15 minutes, but um yeah, we, we certainly haven't tested it, but it'd be interesting to see if, you know, even an hour later that we were still getting the same effects. Thank you. Um, so the next thing is hypothermia, so increased temperature. Now, this is really dangerous in TBI, and it also causes secondary injury, um, promotes that brain swelling and inflammation. It's very difficult to cool your brain down when it gets hot. Um, so what the ALM therapy does is it maintains a stable, mild, hypothermic state of about 34 degrees Celsius, whereas the temperature increases up to about 39 degrees Celsius with the ALM. Now we know that normalization of the blood clotting function um, also improves outcomes after TBI and that coagulopathy that I talked about before is also a big problem in traumatic brain injury. Similar to what it does in hemorrhage, um, the ALM treatment corrects coagulopathy um, resulting from traumatic brain injury. And finally, um, the ALM also prevented heart failure. Um, and this is potentially important because acute heart dysfunction after traumatic brain injury um, is associated with a high increase of um, in-hospital mortality. And this also goes back to those original musings I had after my own accident that nothing in the body um, operates independently. Um, so a brain injury is not limited to the brain, but can have effects on the heart and other organs. And many new drugs that um, show promise um, end up failing and, and possibly because they target one organ or a one cell type or one protein and don't consider the inter interconnectivity of the whole body. Our um, development of ALM has followed what we call a systems approach. So we look at the whole body and all of the body systems after um, injury or bleeding. So that's a brief overview of the ALM story. Um, drug development is a very long, uh, difficult and incredibly expensive process. Um, this year I completed the preclinical safety trials. So this is where we assess high doses of the drug well above what will be used therapeutically. Um, we do this in small and large animals. So um, we did it in rats and pigs. And this is to ensure that the drug is safe and not toxic, um, particularly to the kidneys and the liver. We have found that the ALM is a very safe therapeutic range. Um, so there's no adverse effects, even at doses eight times that we will use, that will potentially be used clinically. 
Um, the ALM is ready for use in the US Special Operations Forces dogs or canines. These magnificent creatures are often the first in during attack operations and they're frequently wounded by return fire um, and suffer multiple blast injuries from explosions. We are also commencing the first human safety trial of, in a controlled surgical environment in Townsville that's starting next year. Um, and then we progressed to larger trials of trauma patients in the US. Um, we're working towards all combat medics having access to the ALM um, to treat injured soldiers on the battlefield um, and at the point of injury and during evacuation by about 2025. So I've spoken a lot about um, battlefield medicine and working with the US military, um, which may make you wonder why I'm still based here in Townsville at the College of Medicine at JCU. So um, let's call this Plan C um, Addendum 3. Trauma, injury and bleeding doesn't just happen on the battlefield. It, it happened to me when I had my own accident. But one of the things that I've learned working in battlefield medicine is how much battlefield medicine influences civilian medicine. For all the chaos and destruction at rigs, war has spurred some of the greatest medical advances, um, particularly in the areas of trauma surgery, emergency care and infectious disease. And the history of um, military medicine shaping civilian healthcare dates way back to 1642 um, when the English Civil War broke out because that was when the first dedicated military hospital was established. There's a lot of examples um, in the areas of aeromedical evacuation, uh, blood storage and transfusion, and modern infection control. And in fact, the discovery of penicillin um, by Alexander Fleming in 1928 was initially overlooked, and it was only made into an effective drug in World War II um, when two medical researchers were trying to find ways to treat infection in troops. We have more modern examples like the um, development of hemostatic bandages and tourniquets to stop bleeding. But what we want to do is to apply the principles of tactical combat casualty care, which have been developed over many decades, to civilian medicine. So I've told you a little bit about my own um, traumatic injuries, and now I'm going to ask you about your own experiences. Um, one of the challenges in the field of medicine that I work in is a lack of public awareness about what it is um, and also the gravity of the problem in society. So if I say the words cancer or diabetes or heart disease, most people would be able to form a pretty clear picture in their head of what these illnesses are. Trauma and injury is so complex because it's so heterogeneous, um, as you can see from my wheel of trauma here. So trauma includes assaults, uh, spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, crush injuries, head trauma, cuts and puncture wounds, um, accidents, obstetric bleeding. So this is maternal bleeding or bleeding after childbirth, penetrating wounds, facial trauma, burns, electrical injury, shock, concussion and broken bones. So my question to you is how many of you have yourself or know someone who suffered trauma? If you can answer the poll question that's hopefully going to pop up now on your screen, um, we'd like to get an idea of the trauma experience of our audience here tonight. end the polling there I think most people have answered it seems yeah okay so 91 percent um that does not surprise me at all um so when you start to think about it because trauma is a global epidemic um it's responsible for 10 percent of deaths worldwide every year we have 5.8 million civilians dying of trauma every single year. It also disproportionately affects young people. It's the leading cause of death in people under 45 years. Similar um, to the battlefield, bleeding is the primary cause of death. So it's, that's responsible for 30 to 40% of these deaths. And bleeding is also the leading cause of direct and preventable death of women. So we have one death during childbirth every four minutes around the world due to bleeding. 
Improving eight outcomes after maternal bleeding um, is, I guess, my plan C addendum four. So unbelievably, uh, the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage is increasing in developed countries, including Australia and the UK. Um, it's also particularly devastating for our Pacific neighbours like Papua New Guinea, where the rates of maternal mortality are excessively high. Importantly, uh, one third to one half of civilian bleeding deaths occur before the patient reaches hospital. So similar to the battlefield, time is the killer. Approximately 30% of Australia's population live in rural and remote environments. And these residents are 50% more likely or twice as likely to die from traumatic injury. Improving healthcare in rural, remote and underserved communities is a key mission for our medical school here at JCU. Not only um, are we training a future medical workforce for rural, regional and remote Australia, um, but our research is aimed at reducing the inequities and in health outcomes in these areas. So when it comes to trauma and injury, longer times to reach hospital combined with other confounding factors such as fuel resources, uh, inclement weather and difficult terrain, contribute to the very high morbidity and mortality that we see for Australians that live outside the major cities. If we wanna save lives in these areas, treatment must begin at the point of injury by first responders. So if a first responder can inject the ALM therapy to stabilize a trauma patient, for example, at the scene of an accident, or an obstetrician or midwife could it deliver, um, administer it in a delivery room if a woman was suffering a severe hemorrhage, it could buy them the time to save a life. Makes me think often, Haley, of those, um, you know, the horror stories that you hear of someone, say, being attacked by a crocodile or by a shark or things like that. And they're yeah. in, you know, the Torres Strait or in these remote locations. Mm. And it takes them sort of eight to 12 hours to actually mm. get to a nearby hospital to receive treatment. I guess that's probably would be an example of the type of situation outside of the the um, military applications where this could really be used. Absolutely. I distinctly recall there was um, one of the shark attacks um, um, off, yeah, in the Whitsundays and um, I was speaking to one of the um, aeromedical retrieval guys and um, he was telling me how it was just so complex. So they had to obviously get from, from the ocean um, uh, and get them in. And there was nowhere for the, um, the life flight rescue helicopter to land. Um, so they had to land at, Card they had to land at Cardwell School. Um, they then had to drive an ambulance from the jetty to um, the school. Um, and it ended up taking over five hours to get um, that patient to Cairns Hospital. So um, you can see how if we can get a treatment um, in the field um, and stabilize the patient, then you reduce that stress for that, that transport time. Wow. So the other critical um, public health problem, um, aside from bleeding, is traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injury occurs more than any other disease, including cancer, and it affects um, all age groups. Um, Every time I say this figure, it shocks me, but it is estimated that 42 million people will suffer a TBI every year. And that includes more than 3 million children under the age of 18. So this includes um, accidents and one punch attacks, assaults, um, as well as domestic violence incidents. And there's also been an increase um, in traumatic brain injury in the elderly population. Um, that's particularly in high income countries and that's due to, due to falls. Um, and there is all this increasing evidence now that TBI may be a risk factor for the development of age-associated neurodegenerative disorders. So this is things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and MS. Um, I had concussion on that wheel of trauma, and that's likely to be one of the most common causes of trauma that most people experience. Concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury, and it's now recognized as an increasing and serious health problem in many sports. So head impacts like the ones we see in every week in rugby league, rugby union, AFL, are a real concern um, because there's evidence that the development of chronic or progressive symptoms is linked to those repeated concussions before the brain's recovered sufficiently. The incidence um, of concussion in rugby league is 1.5 times higher than American football or gridiron. And there's estimates that there's about 20 concussions per 1,000 player matched hours in the AFL. And it's not just professional athletes at risk. So a study in Sydney showed um, a high incidence of mild traumatic brain injury in non-professional rugby union players. And it's also the most common cause of injury um, in amateur AFL players comprising 15% of all injuries. 
We know that um, concussion is an inherent risk of all sports, but there is these strong links between repeated concussions and development of long-term neurological impairments, and these require really urgent attention. So one of the um, future plans for the ALM is development of a nano patch, um, which could be administered um, on the field or in the dressing room when, a, when an athlete suffers a, a suspected concussion, um, just to reduce the severity of the injury and improve the recovery times so we can make contact sports safer um, for all participants. So before you go on, Hayley, yeah. I'll just quickly jump in again, because obviously that, that's a really interesting, you've presented some really interesting information on that last slide. And I'm sure a lot of people in the audience um, would sort of be thinking of their own situation, whether they've played, you know, whether mm. it be indoor cricket or, you know, football or whatever it might be on the weekends in their own personal time. Mm. So I guess like how bad does a concussion, because, uh, you know, lots of people know someone who's had a concussion, but mm. in your experience or in the research that you've done, how bad does a concussion have to actually be for it to have some potential long-term effects? Mm. So, and the, one of the, the scary things about it is that, um, we don't actually, so people can respond very differently, basically. And, um, you know, there's um, I, actually a, a a close friend of my brother's. So she um, had a fall. She was playing um, indoor netball, had a fall um, the year before last. And she developed, it seemingly wasn't a big deal. She fell on her jaw, um, but she's developed post-concussion syndrome. So this is this syndrome that develops and we don't know why it develops in some people and not others. Um, but yes, yeah, and she's had a really difficult time um, with a lot of memory loss and, um, and other sort of cognitive deficits. Um, but the thing is as well, there's been this interesting research done that shows that, you know, if you have one concussion, then it increases your chance of having another concussion. And then by the time you have the, the second concussion, that increases your likelihood of having a third concussion by about nine times. And it has a domino effect almost. And one of the challenges, it's a very difficult to know. We can't actually, you know, you can't, a lot of the time, especially for a concussion, it's a mild traumatic brain injury. There's no x-ray or anything that we can see the damage to know, oh, you're healed. You're okay to go back on the field. Um and so, you know, there's some tools that they use in terms of just a, a basic assessment, you know, asking different questions, um, which I think a lot of the professional um, football players probably know how to cheat the system now. But um, yeah, and, and so we don't have really good diagnostics as well to be able to tell us like when the brain's actually recovered enough. Um, and so um, I think you, we will see this um, this field kind of explode well, and the research into this explode, hopefully, because I said we can't ignore it any longer um, and, and we're starting to see those um, sports people in their 40s and 50s um, having psychiatric disturbances having behavioral changes um, and you can't deny the links now between those repeated head knocks and those that later later development so and and even when we think about it like I think we don't realize but when you um our, our brain sort of sits in our skull and our skull's there to protect it. But when you have a concussion or a head impact, like your brain is literally shaking in your head. And so um, there's this damage. And even if we can't see it, um, you know, on an X-ray or a CT scan, there's something that's gone on at the cellular level. And it's very difficult to know when it's okay. And, you know, you're fully recovered, but and it's also very difficult to make, you know, we, we also don't want to um, discourage sport because, you know, especially in young people, you know, we want kids to be out there playing sport, but it's just about trying to make it safer. Um, but yeah, definitely for, um, I'm, I'm all for the headgear for the, for the young, young ones where their brains are still developing as well. Thanks, Hayley. No worries. So, um, yeah, I, I guess you may have realised that I don't really limit myself to one challenge. Um, and because of that systems approach that, that we used in developing the ALM, um, we, we see lots of possibilities for its translation um, for other medical problems. There's 310 million major surgeries performed every year around the world. And although they're essential for improving survival and quality of life, major surgery is actually a trauma in itself. And that's something that I can personally attest to. So surgeries um, like joint replacements where you've got bone soaring, uh, neurosurgery, which involves drilling through the skull um, or even open heart surgery where the chest is cracked open. These result in that same physiological response as a traumatic brain, as a traumatic injury. So you get coagulopathy, you get inflammation. 
The ALM um, administered preoperatively and also during the surgery may actually minimise that pathophysiological response um, and prevent excessive bleeding, which would reduce transfusion requirements, um, possibly reduce pain and even scarring, um, which would improve function postoperatively. Um, ALM is also unique in that it has this dual protection against both sterile trauma, a sterile injury like trauma, but also infection. So we have done studies in infection and there was one um, preclinical study that we did um, where we showed six days survival without antibiotics, so no antibiotics, after polymicrobial sepsis. So this is multiple bacterial infections in the bloodstream. And one of our previous medical students, uh, Dr. Lisa Davenport, she completed the first evaluation of the ALM therapy in a Burns model um, during her honours project. And she showed that the ALM therapy um, prevented organ injury in the lungs, um, the gut and the heart after severe thermal burn. Firstly, though, um, we have to get the introduction of the ALM therapy into the battlefield, um, followed by development of a protocol for ALM use in injured and bleeding civilian patients. So the end goal is to have the ALM therapy, not just in every soldier's backpack, um, but also in ambulances, uh, Royal Flying Doctor Service planes, life flight rescue helicopters, um, in medical facilities, in rural medical practices, and in medical kits on remote stations. So we, I guess we see endless possibilities, it's just that the goal is literally to save millions of lives. So um, now I've told you the story of ALM, I will return to my task of providing advice um, and hopefully some inspiration for any students out there, wherever on their plan they may currently be. So these pictures kind of sum up um, the lessons that I, I've learned on my individual journey. First, uh, don't be afraid of change. Um, so because change, although it's sometimes uncomfortable, it could be a chance for something so much better. Um, secondly, um, while it's good to have an idea of your passion and where you want to go, don't ignore the pathways to the left or the right and any of the opportunities that they may hold. I threw in a Lizzo quote um, for the youngsters out there, um, I just snap and pivot. Um, this is, is really fantastic advice actually and um, I think yeah the word pivot is just really fun to say so that's why I threw that one in there. Um, Grow at your own pace. This was the hardest lesson for me to learn. Um, I'm going to admit that. Um, my first degree took so much longer than anyone else, um, but I learned it was okay to be different. So you don't have to follow the same road as everyone else um, who happens to share the same birth year as yourself. So if you spend every day being the best that you can be, um, you will succeed. And turning negatives into positives, although it's sometimes difficult, it's especially important, I guess, in the times that we currently find ourselves in. So I've got to slide 31, but um, I have to mention coronavirus because it's impossible to ignore. Um, for the class of 2020, I'm not going to sugarcoat what you faced in your final year of schooling. Um, let's face it, it sucks. Um, you had to learn from home. You possibly lost your part-time job. You couldn't participate in team sports and your other activities or spend time with your friends. Um, and you're also the first... Um, first year through the new ATAR system. So I can em empathise somewhat with that. So my older brother's year was actually the first when the OP system was introduced into Queensland. And there's just so many unknowns uh, on top of all the other uncertainty that this year has brought. You may not want to hear it um, right now, but the events of this year will actually benefit you in the future. Because you were forced um, to uh, remote learn and learn independently, it actually puts you one step ahead coming into university. So many students struggle in the first year of university um, just in that transition from school learning, which has structure, to university learning, where it's literally all up to you. Um, you have, like everyone else, had to develop resilience. Resilience is like a muscle or a neural pathway in the brain. You have to use it um, to develop it and to keep it. And you'll be able to handle whatever life throws at you um, because of the resilience that you've developed at this early point in your life. And although you may be upset that schoolies is cancelled, um, I do have a little tip for you on that as well. So save your money um, and plan a really fantastic holiday with your friends when all this is over. 
because of um, my accident, my surgeries, I actually didn't get to go overseas until I was 28, which just seemed so ancient to me at the time. But um, I made up for it. I, I went on an epic round the world trip um, to Africa, Mauritius, the UK, Europe and US and had at the time of my life. And you will get that opportunity eventually. So I guess here I am, a living, breathing example that sometimes on the way to a dream, you get lost and find a better one. Somehow I found myself in the most unique career, which combines both my loves of medicine and science. So no day is the same. Um, I get to work across labs and in hospitals. I've used leading edge medical technology, including the absolute best in diagnostics and robotic surgical equipment. I was fortunate enough to train with the head neurosurgeon at Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark. I've, I've worked with the trauma surgeons at the Naval Medical Research Centre in Maryland in the US. And I've guest lectured at the University of Leuven in Belgium. I also mentor medical students and get them involved in research. So they too can help develop the medical solutions of the future. And in all of that, this job's taken me all over the world. That's one of the beautiful things about science. Um, it's a global endeavor. And while a lot of my time is spent solo working in a lab, I've also had the opportunity to work with phenomenal scientists and doctors in so many different places. So actually most of my time outside of Australia has been spent in this beautiful little city called Aarhus in Denmark. So it is literally on the other side of the world um, to where we are in Townsville. It takes me about 45 hours to get there. Um, but I've been traveling there almost annually since 2011 um, to, to take part in two to three month research projects. And I'm ashamed to say that despite all that time there, I still only know two words of Danish. So tak, which means thank you, and gris, which means pig. Um, the staff have tried to teach me more words, but um, whenever I say, um, try and speak in Danish, um, it just comes out absurdly different and I get laughed at. So, so I gave up, blaming my North Queensland dialect on that one. Um, but the point I guess I'm trying to make is that there's no language barrier in medicine and science. We're all serving a common goal to save lives and improve patient outcomes. Which brings me to the end and a flashback to the title of tonight's webinar, um, Not All, All Superheroes Wear Stethoscopes. So 2020 has been a year where we've recognised and deservedly thanked all the frontline workers. So the doctors, the nurses, the allied health professionals who have put themselves at risk um, to keep us all safe. I'd also like you to consider what's behind that front line because by its very nature, in order for there to be a front line, there needs to be a support structure behind it. That is scientists. You know, think about it. Um, Batman couldn't save the world without his utility belt and his Batmobile. And I don't think it's any secret that it's not Batman himself that's designing, developing and refining those tools. Scientists work in the background, you know, without fuss or fanfare, just getting the job done. I don't do what I do um, for praise or recognition. I do it for the soldier bleeding on the ground or the accident victim in country Queensland. What I am passionate about is getting the message across that medicine does not progress without research and we must invest in medical research so that everyone, all people, regardless of location or situation, can lead long, healthy and productive lives. And so if there are any students out there, you, if you're curious about the world and the body and how it works, why not consider medical research when you're coming up with your own plan? You know, we really need good, dedicating, hardworking people to keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. Thanks, Hayley. That's Thanks, fantastic. Tara. So look, before we wrap up, I'm going to throw to the audience and see if we've got any questions that anyone would like to ask of Hayley before we, we conclude the webinar this evening. Give me one moment. So one question that we've had come through just um, is actually in relation, I guess, to some of the points that you touched on towards the end in regards to COVID. Um, mm. And, you know, obviously you've talked through your presentation about all of these um, positive in, in impacts that this drug can can have on the bottom, uh, on the on the body and reducing the humans, uh, sorry, the immune system response, I guess, um, to some of these sort of bad situations. So the, the member from the audience is actually just asking, um, is ALM something that could actually be used, I guess, in the fight against COVID-19? 
Yeah, we definitely think it would have a role. Um, so we have put in a, a couple of proposals um, to look at. A lot of the effort at the moment is based on um, vaccine development, but I still think it's really important that, that we do have treatments. And so the ALM is ideal because um, it's protecting those major organs, um, the lungs, the brain and the heart, um, which are affected in COVID. And you know, when you think about COVID, it, it's not so much the actual virus itself that's that's killing people, it's the body's response to it. So the body um, has this excessive infl inflammatory response that activates the immune system. So if we can use ALM to actually blunt that response, um, and this is similar to what we've seen with it, what we have seen with our studies we've done in bacterial infection, if you blunt that response, um, you then reduce all of the secondary injury. And so a lot of um, patients with COVID are actually um, having heart damage and just actually in the last couple of months we're seeing a lot of centres reporting different brain injuries associated with COVID so um, I think it has a really important you know we think it has a really important role to play I'd really love to um, to try it I think I think COVID's not going anywhere I think you know obviously um, we hope that we can get a really good vaccine but there's still going to be people um, that are going to um, fall ill with COVID so some people can't zero convert vaccines and um, we still need really effective treatments and this sort of treatment um, which is ideal for someone who's critically ill like that I think would have huge benefits so yeah we would love to do that just need some funding to do it. So another question that's come in is actually, how does ALM actually work at a molecular level? Is that something you're aware of? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the, there's still a lot that we, we've got better. Um, so obviously um, ALM, you can see it has so many different effects on so many different body systems. And um, so there's no simple answer to how it works, um, but we, we're starting to come up with a picture, but in terms of from an actual molecular level, that's our most recent work we've done. And so what we know um, that the ALM does is it in the cell, which is, you know, sort of our, our tissues are made up of cells. So within the cell, so the ALM can activate different genes. And so, and this is what, this this is how it sort of um, has that effect to reduce whole body metabolism. So it actually um, changes the expression of the master genes of metabolism. One of the curious things is that so um, we get it upregulates these in the brain and the heart. So these are the really important um, um, areas of our body, but it down regulates it in areas we don't need. I've got no idea how it knows how to do that. Um, but we do know there is at a molecular level, there's changes in gene expression. Um, and also there's changes to the endothelium. So the endothelium is the lining that makes up all of our blood vessels. So it's this huge surface area of like 7,000 meters squared, like a, huge, a football field worth of surface area that the ALM can work on. And that's how it um, corrects the coagulopathy. And that's how it blunts the inflammation. But there's also, it also impacts the central nervous system. So it, it sort of changes um, the bodies from a, a fight or flight response to a rest and digest response, which is part of that stabilization. Um, so multiple mechanisms that we're still um, divulging, but um, yeah, you almost need an hour to try and work through that. <laughs> that's the, another the topic the for ALM, another night. Yeah, it's a $64 yeah. million dollar question, but we are, we're definitely working on it because we have to know how it works and all of the mechanisms um, as part of that process to, you you know, to use it as a drug. Okay, so we'll, we'll save that one then for the next webinar yeah. then that you run, <laughs> Hayley. Um, so another one that's, I guess, come through from the audience is really, is actually around, you know, courses that um, potentially someone might study. Obviously, there's some of the obvious, like a, a, a career or, or doing a studying medicine or even mm. pharmacy um, to actually move into, obviously, medical research. Um, but uh, obviously your pathway with science is there any other ways that you can think of that someone might actually um in terms of undergraduate study might pursue yeah so I mean yeah so I I did um I think you know I sort of started with this that we do have a specialized um biomedical science degree um here here at JCU um so I went the science route because um I could keep my options open so because I love so many different things um but yes yeah, say so there's the medicine um there's um biomed there's um, a, a science degree that you can sort of pick and choose but I think um, you know that's the thing I guess I learned as well that you know and what I would say to anyone any students out there is that it's okay to change too and so you might do a year of something you might do a year of, of one of the allied health um, 
you know, occupational therapy or um, speech pathology and decide it's not really right for you. Um, so, but don't be afraid to make that manoeuvre then to then go, oh, I'm more interested in this. Um, so there's other avenues. You don't have to set yourself. I know there's so much pressure put, you know, when you're in year 11 and 12, or you've got to decide what you're going to do. And um, so, but there's always avenues to, um, to do that. But yeah, in terms of research, to say, and, and what's really great now is that a lot more um, medicine um, clinicians and medical students are getting involved in research and so that's something that um, happens a lot in Europe um, and so I, I've had that experience in Denmark it's really great so all the clinicians are involved in research it's very difficult for doctors to do research because of time restraints but um, a lot of students now we, we've I've literally a couple of weekends ago I've had I had three students um, yeah year three students medical students email me from JC saying oh, I'm just really interested in research so you can you know get in contact with there's lots of different researchers um, at JCU we have research profiles um, just get in contact and go and talk to someone and you know they Great might be able you, you might be able to just do something you know you know observe or do something and you might find what you like through that so never be afraid to ask that's yeah that's great thank you so much Hayley well look thanks for such a wonderful presentation you know I could continue talking to you about this for hours <laughs> but I'm really conscious that we've already gone wildly over time I know sorry so, about that <laughs> no, no. um so look uh, before everybody oh, departs let me, we sorry just Yep. It's okay. Just wanted to say, you know, we'd really appreciate everybody's feedback um, so that we really, that we can continue to deliver interesting and engaging webinars throughout this series. Um, so if you could please spare a couple of additional moments just to complete the feedback survey, that would really be fantastic. Um, the link will appear on the screen once the webinar concludes. And obviously make sure you stay tuned or register for the next webinar, which is going to be on the 19th of November. Um, and we're going to be joined by JCU experts on community empowerment, transformative cities and building a climate resilient economy. So thank you so much, everybody, and good night. Thanks.